The word Lent itself is from the ancient Saxon Lenitan, meaning spring, which is called Lenitan Tide because it is the time of year when the days noticeably increase in length. Lenitan was also the name for the month of March, again because of the lengthening of the days. The practice of fasting in Lent goes back to the beginning of the New Testament times when the earliest of records reveal that there was a period of not 40 days but 40 hours of fasting observed just prior to a candidate's Easter baptism. So sometime between Good Friday and Easter morning, right in that period there, it was 40 hours of fasting. But gradually this practice widened until by the 7th century, 40 days was observed commemorating the fast of 40 days that Jesus fasted, the fast of Moses, <clears throat> and of Elijah, who also fasted those same number of days. In the beginning, the observance included only new converts. Then, penitents, who had sinned grievously, were added, and finally, it became a celebration for the whole church in the seventh century. Ash Wednesday received its name when the Roman Catholic Church would sprinkle ashes on the heads of those who desired to do penance for their sins. They did this on the first day of Lent, which is Wednesday, that's today. And after repentance, they were received into the church. The sprinkling was in the sign of the cross. And this practice is observed by more than Roman Catholics today. My mother remembers as a girl some neighbors who were not Roman Catholic, but on Ash Wednesday came home with ashes on their forehead. Might have been Episcopalian, I'm not sure. But they came home with the sign of the cross, or it was in the sign of the cross. The ashes had been saved from the palm branches the Easter Sunday before and burned in the Roman Catholic Church. There's a sprinkling of what's termed as holy water. And then those ashes are placed upon the person who begins a period of mourning, a period of repentance. You notice I'm not making fun of Lent. And you notice that when I refer to the church, I don't separate myself from that great institution that came down through the medieval times, nor the Anglican church, nor that which has happened since then, clear down to the Scott D. Pope Christ Fellowship. Not all can we approve of, but all through those years, there were a sincere number of people endeavoring to make proper observance. Some have had questions about the observance of special days, but the Apostle Paul had no questions either way. For he wrote to the church at Rome, if one man keeps certain days, I'm reading from Romans 14, 5, and 6 from the one translation, if one man keeps certain days as holier than others, now this is very crucial to your thinking and mine tonight. I trust you'll get this. If one man keeps certain days as holier than others, and another considers all days to be equally holy, each must be left free to hold his own opinion. That's what God's servant, the Apostle Paul, said. The one who observes special days, he goes on then, for the one who holds special days and says something honorable. The one who observes special days does so in honor of the Lord. 
wonder why we haven't known that in Protestant Christianity, especially in evangelical Christianity. The Apostle Paul said that. If one man keeps certain days as holier than others, and another keep, considers all days to be equally holy, each must be left free to hold his own opinion. But the one who observes special days does so in honor of the Lord. That's what God's servant said, the greatest apostle that we know anything about in the Bible times. So Paul had no question on special days. Incidentally, if you've had any psychology at all or studied even slightly on the psychology of man, you know that we have to have renewed purpose. Part of the reason that we're not able to continue on a certain line of faithfulness is simply in our nature. Perhaps we were touched in the fall to this extent, but every person has to have renewed purpose. There's very few people that can hold purpose out continually until Jesus calls them home about anything. That purpose has to be renewed. And one thing that Christmas and Easter and, yes, if one does observe the practice of Lent, is that it renews purpose. A man can examine himself and find out if there's the need for renewal. And if there's a need for renewal, then his purpose can be renewed and he can begin anew or again. That's what revival is all about. Others have had questions about the validity of fasting. But the Bible has no question about its validity. In the Old Testament, now I've written this down but, and I have to read it because it's, some of it's very technical, but I thought it would help you if you knew that I did it myself. And uh, I did it with a view to helping all of us here tonight on Ash Wednesday. The Bible has no question about its validity. In the Old Testament, days of fasting were proclaimed, proclaimed in times of national calamity and were accompanied by a call for confession of national sins. You'll find that reference in 1 Samuel 7 and 6 and in 2 Chronicles 20 and 3. And although the disciples of Jesus did not fast while he was with them, as did the Pharisees and the disciples of John, Jesus indicated that they would do so after he, the bridegroom, was gone. Someone questioned Jesus one day about the lack of fasting, uh, fasting observance by his disciples, and Jesus gave this explanation. Can you make the children of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But, he said, the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. So the Bible doesn't have any question about it. There is a place to fast. Luke 5, that references in Luke 5, 34 and 35. During the 18th century, the strict observance of the Lenten fast was generally abandoned. But devout saints like William Law and John Wesley still advocated it. For the most part, and this reference I've chosen from Herbert Lockyer, fasting represents an attitude of detachment from the things of time and sense, whether it be food or pleasure or lawful ambition. I want to repeat that because I want to vary that somewhat in my emphasis tonight. May I repeat what Herbert Lockyer has said about traditional fasting. Fasting represents an attitude of detachment from the things of time and sense whether it be food or pleasure or lawful ambition. And prayer, which should accompany fasting, represents the complementary attitude of attachment to the things of God. Detachment, fasting from time and sense and things of lawful ambition. And prayer, attachment to the things of God 
So during this Lenten season, we should readily determine, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, what particular forms our fasting should take, thus helping our spiritual development. Before I share as pastor what I feel the Holy Spirit is leading us, leading us in as a body of believers, the body of Christ, if you please, let me repeat the essence of my sermon Sunday night. I'm disturbed that somebody thought I was preaching about fasting because I was not. I mentioned fasting, but only as a symbol. Then when folks came to me and said, well, we're sure glad you preached on that. We've been thinking about fasting. I knew they didn't hear me. I only spoke of fasting as a symbol. I believe in fasting. I've endorsed it tonight, even as Jesus and the Bible has endorsed it. But that's not what I said Sunday night. And that's got me disturbed. That means that somebody plugged in and plugged out and plugged in and plugged out, plugged in, plugged out, and didn't know that I wasn't preaching on fasting. So in my concern about what fasting really is, I wanted to review what I really said. <laughs> what I said was taken from G. Campbell Morgan, and this is what he said is the essence of fasting. Now you'll notice that this is different, different than what Herbert Lockyer said when he spoke of traditional fasting. G. Campbell Morgan wanted to point out, and I tried to preach that Sunday night, what the essence of fasting really is. And here it is. Because fasting, if God calls upon you to do it, symbolizes something deeper. And here's what G. Campbell Morgan said, one of the greatest preachers of all times. Fasting is the denial of everything that interferes with intimate direct fellowship between the life or between one's person and God. Well, that's quite different than doing without something that concerns time or sense or lawful ambition. That is traditional fasting. But the essence of fasting, which I preached about, remember what I said? I said that fasting powers prayer, defined like this, the denial of, of everything in order that the channel may be clear with God, that's prayer. In order that the life may be found in almsgiving, that too was only mentioned in symbol. Yes, that's right. Almsgiving was the total life of giving. Yes. Alms was the outward expression of a life of giving. So I didn't preach on fasting Sunday night. And those of you who thank me for doing it, thank me for doing something I didn't do. I just mentioned fasting as a symbol. Yes, sir. A symbol or uh, the essence of which is the denial of everything that interferes with intimate direct fellowship between the life and God. We may have our symbol of fasting if we like. And especially if God leads. Don't ever fast more than three days without water. Because it'll do damage to the body unless there is a divine anointing like Jesus had or Moses or Elijah. Water must be had in all fast beyond three days. And uh, most of us know this, but I wanted to mention this. I remember preaching years and years ago on fasting and preaching on voluntary fasting and involuntary fasting. Sometimes the heart's so burdened that it involuntary fast. It can't help it. You can't eat. You can't drink. You're burdened. That I pray for that time to come upon us till there won't be any denial involved. A man will have to force himself to eat because his prayer burden is he's so burdened over people, so burdened over the persons that are lost, so burdened over nominal Christianity, so burdened over a church that's backslidden and going to hell. Boy, you get a burden like that. And you got an involuntary fast on your hands. You have to take a little sip, a little something to hold the body together. There's such a burden upon one. And though I believe in that kind of fasting, I still wasn't speaking about that. You can see that I wasn't. Fasting, this that I'm talking about, has to do with what Jesus 
spoke to us about when he said, you cannot be my disciple unless you do it. And you, in order to follow me, he said, you have to deny yourself. That's fasting. Even if it's something that's lawful years, take up your cross. That goes along when you start that life of self-denial. That goes along with it because there's a cross in the path of every man's obedience. And then he said, follow me. It is the life suffering, the loss, even of rights, in order that it may come into a more strenuous relationship with God. This is what fasting really is all about. That is the deepest means of grace. And in proportion as we learn what fasting really means, we approach the infinite source of power. And that's what Brother Barker spoke about today. I can see that we, while he was speaking, especially more lengthy there, that we were not frightened of God very much. Had we been frightened of God, we would have been more helpful, more loving, and more open in our hearts to help and to assist. See, you can tell it right now. See, when he reached a certain point, that meant he was trying to obey God, find out where to go. When he felt that pullback that you put in your mind, then he felt he had to go on to get whatever that was out of here. It's an old-time exhorter. That's the way an old-time preacher has to preach. See, and when I tell you this, God witnesses. I expect you to hold your heads up when he's talking. I expect you to act right, just like he told it out. I expect you to be a soldier on the battlefield. Like when Dad told me, son, respect your elders. Boy, I kept up, didn't I? Kept my face up. I helped. I cooperated. I said amen. Made myself a part of his exhortation. I shouldn't have to tell you this after 12 years, but I'm having to tell you. I'm pretty disturbed uh, with us. <laughs> Lovingly, I pray, but I'm disturbed that we don't know how to act. Go down in our seat, and then the man of God got to plow, plow and pull. And we said, we said just like little, but you know, all the little children in the audience, they just thought it was great. Boy, they just, just. Now, if you resent that, you need it more than I can tell. You can tell by me taking your spiritual temperature just now that you need a lot of help. I thought I'd tell you that because if you claim to love me, you, you'll appreciate what I've got to say about this and repent over it. Start Ash Wendy. If it do you any good, get with somebody that's got some burnt up ashes and have them put on your face. So everybody that got caught in that thing right there needs ashes on their face. As a, <laughs> but they need to assemble more in their heart. Isn't it something I saw that while ago? I said, Jesus, I've talked to these people all these years. Right here, we're in a, we're in a test. Not able to pass it. Boy, keep the face up. Keep her up. Keep looking. Keep helping. Keep saying amen. Keep right in there. Keep the glory up. Keep the joy flowing. God might do something for us. God might help us. After a while. I talk softly and carefully and told you how to act and then we get in a certain place and we don't know how to act. Well, we need to fast. We need to pray. After that comes prayer. And to the fasting life, this is delightful, natural, and spontaneous. The highest outreaching of the life is only possible as it is free from sordidness, sensuality, and the dust of the day. And thus can hold unhindered spiritual communion with God. Now, did you note the difference? I gave you a traditional definition, and I gave you then a definition that G. Campbell Morgan gave us that, made, that showed us that fasting was only a symbol. A fasting, real fasting, is a life of self-denial. I hope you noted the difference. Let me review it again. Herbert Lockyer says, Traditionally, fasting represents an attitude of detachment from the things of time and sense, whether it be food or pleasure or lawful ambition. But G. Campbell Morgan says, True fasting, the essence of fasting, is the sense of detachment from the things of time 
uh, and since in only a symbol, he said this is only a symbol, the essence of fasting is a lifestyle advocated by Jesus when he said that in order to be his disciple, one must deny himself, take up his cross and follow him. Fasting then in its real and deeper meaning is the denial of everything that interferes with intimate, direct fellowship with God. This difference is the real reason why neither Jesus nor Brother Ham focuses on fasting as a symbol. Because in, in focusing upon the symbol, we lose the essence of fasting. That's why they went out and hid in caves and became hermits. And, but they, they, fo- they focused on the symbol. They missed the essence. Now, he, this is very dangerous. I, I read today, uh, Brother Packer, who's just written Beyond the Battle of the Bible, he's an Anglican, and I was amazed at his writings. A beautiful Anglican writer that we all read after knowing God, he wrote. He's a very popular writer, writer in evangelical Christianity today. IVP, University Press, publishes most of what he writes. He said, in the Anglican Church, the attention, the focus is coming down to Holy Communion. That's an improper focus. That's a symbol. Yes, sir. He said the focus is the Word of God. Now, he's an Anglican. He's got a right to talk that way. You see, down through the years, the church has done it over and over again. They'll focus on the symbol. They'll focus on baptism. They'll focus. You, do you know anybody that focuses on baptism? There are folks that do that. Focus that bring the whole church down. Anglicanism, Anglicanism has brought the whole focus down to communion. But unless you believe, like some people, it is not the means of grace. The Word of God is the means of grace. Boy, and Packer said it. Boy, I'm telling you, and he was telling how wonderful, how wonderful the Anglican prayer book was, the Episcopalian prayer book. Why? Because it's, it's riddled through and through with the Word of God. If a man reads it under the anointing, he gets himself a powerful lot of the Word. Yes. Boy, I appreciated it. So I just thought I'd let you hear the lectionary scriptures tonight that the saints are reading all over the world because I'm telling you, we've got a fault, evangelicals. We don't have near enough of the Word. We don't have near enough of the word read. You see what I mean? Because God will speak in his written word. Will speak to us. And will feed our souls and will talk to us. There, you see, is the primary means of grace. Is in, is in the speaking of God. Oh, I thought it was tremendous. So, we don't focus on the symbol. God makes appears with our relationship with God. That's a life of self-denial. Now, you, you see, it may or may not be in material things. It might be that he wants us at a dinner. See, whatever he sanctifies, he sanctifies. Yes, sir. It, oh, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See? That's right. So you, if you have to understand why Jesus did as he did when he walked this earth, or why Brother Helms, like he is, who's fasted more than most men, I mean as a symbol. But he doesn't say much about it, nor does he advocate it much. Why? Because he's trying to advocate the advocate the essence of fasting, which is a detachment from everything that would interfere with your relationship with God. Oh, I just saw it when I was home. I said, "Jesus, I told you, fellas, I had something wonderful." I said, I didn't read this in a book, but I was studying that, and I saw the difference between G. Campbell Morgan and as Herbert Lockyer and his tradition. I said, Jesus, I hope my people will get it. What disturbed me was people thought I preached on fasting Saturday night. I, I didn't preach on fasting at all. I just mentioned the symbol, and it disturbed me. I said, oh, God, help us some way to get what this is all about. Well, I'm sure glad you preach on fasting, preacher. I don't want anybody to feel bad about that. But if you can realize this, you realize you, you went in and out on me. You didn't hear me. Because I really didn't preach on that. I preached on the essence of fasting and the essence of almsgiving, the essence of prayer, what the really the deeper meaning was all about. And there's quite a bit of difference.
I, I, and I wanted to point out that baptism is only a symbol. A symbol, an outward symbol of an inward work. And if we concentrate on that as a symbol alone, the whole business of repentance may go by the wayside. Paul, Jesus wanted us to be circumcised of heart. Even in the Old Testament, where the rite of circumcision was so important, the prophet said, you need to be circumcised of heart. That was the cry, because even then, the outward sign was to have, had primarily just a sign of an inward meaning. Of the people who were willing to live for God, who were willing to give all. The Lord's Supper is a symbol of the drinking and the eating of the life of Christ. But to focus on this symbol is exclusively is to do what nominal Christianity has done for thousands of years. Puff up the symbol and you lost the essence. If you're going to lose anything, lose the symbol, but don't lose the essence. I don't want you to think I'm a heretic, but I'm not a heretic. Packer himself, who was Anglican, pointed out that Jesus had very little say about taking the Lord's Supper. And the Bible gives no explicit directions concerning it. It said, as often as you take it. That's significant, David. David, if I had a good Baptist here, they ought to be having a great time. Because the Word's been central. But it's more than the written Word. It's the Word of God spoken through a man that testifies. How many times did the Lord witness while He was speaking? Quite a number of times. You see. And so God was speaking. The Word of God was coming through the heart of a believer. You see. And I'm trying my best now to get the Word of Christ, the Word of God across to us. It's in this. Here is the means of grace. When the Holy Spirit speaks, when God speaks, what men and women need is for God to speak. And a life of self-denial opens the channel for God to speak. True, the symbol, doing without something, may intensify our concern. To the, to, to, as insofar as it's a good aid, it is good. But it is never primary. And so the medieval church lost, lost its true meaning. Here's a scripture that amazed me tonight that I don't know hardly how I found it. But it seemed to apply to my concern here for us. And it's in, a, it's in I've got a, a scripture lesson for Lent found in Matthew 21. Well, this is not in the lectionary, but God may point out most anything in his word on any occasion. But I found this interesting. Matthew 21. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons. Now, they had questioned his authority. And Jesus had asked them questions. You remember this in the story of Jesus. He asked them questions they could not answer. They would not answer. They wouldn't tell what uh, ministry John was. What... Uh, where John got his authority. So Jesus said, well, neither tell I you, but what authority I do these things. But what think ye? Now he asked them a question. A certain man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he experienced Lent. He repented. He had a true um, experience of Lent. For confession is central and repentance is central to the 40 days, not excluding the Sundays. They're not their days of feast. Um, and he repented and he went. But now listen to this. Here's where I find the church today. And he came to the second, and he said, likewise. And he answered and said, in other words, he asked him to go work in the vineyard. He said, I go, sir, and went not. That fascinates me. 
I go, sir, and went not. Hmm. Now, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. Jesus asked the question in verse 31. Whether of them twain did uh, the will of, of his father. Well, they, they said unto him, the first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. They were the ones who said, we go. But they did not. They would not obey the father. The harlots and the publicans said, we won't go. But when John came, they repented. John the Baptist came, they repented. The publicans and the harlots who said, we will not go to the religious authority of that day. We will not do it. Though the invitation was in the institution. The invitation of the Father was there. God spoke through Old Testament Israel. He spoke in the temple. He did the calling. But the harlots and publicans said, we'll not do it. But John came preaching and they repented. And Pharisees... The call was made in the institutions. The call were made in the Hebrew schools. The call was made at the place of prayer. They said, we'll go. But they didn't go. They wouldn't do it. They wouldn't obey. It was just a form of godliness denying the power thereof. Boy, Jesus said to the Pharisees, now they're beginning to perceive. He's talking about them. They're pretty angry about it. They want to destroy him over it. He's already cleansed the temple. Judgment's already been made on Jerusalem. He said... The hearts and the publicans will get into heaven before you will. But, now wait a minute. I see some hope. I see a call to Lent here. Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots, they're having a true Lent when John came. But he said they go into the kingdom before you. Still hope for us. But not without Lent. Not without repentance. Not without confession. Maybe I better rewrite this. Or add to it. Not adding to the word, but add a chapter that could be added if we were to obey. And he came to the second and said likewise. This is from the 30th verse. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Now here's what I want to add for us. But afterward, he repented and went. (laughs) That's Lent. That's Lent. The institutional folks. That's Lent. That's why Lent's necessary. He said, I go. But he wouldn't obey. He said, well, the publicans and the... The heart that's going to the kingdom before you. Well, the only way in the world that can happen is there's got to be a lint there somewhere. So I said, Jesus, we'll just add a third one here. But afterward, the church repented and went into the vineyard to begin to obey. We've observed a lot of symbols, but oftentimes we've not kept the true meaning. Of what it's all about. Lent is a time of getting back to the fundamentals. Lent is a time of confession that we've said, yes, Jesus, we will, and then we didn't do it. And we're plain, old, hard, moss back Pharisees. Better word for it, sinner. In need of repentance. And so God, in the wisdom of the institutional church, has provided a time of repentance. It's called Lent. And after centuries and centuries and centuries, it became not only a time for the new converts and for those who wanted to be restored after they committed what was then described as awful sins, but it became a time for all the church to examine their hearts before God and get right with God. 
to do something more than observe the symbol. To really walk with God in self-denial. But afterward, he repented and went. May I, as pastor, offer recommendations for Lent. It touches my own heart. It touches my own heart. My recommendations. Read, pray, witness, obey. You cannot stay spiritually alive without them. You're coming here on even three services a week is ineffective and only symbolic unless you read, pray, witness, obey and meet with God's people regularly. You that are here on this faithful Wednesday night, continue to be faithful. We've got to talk to the Sunday crowd. I said, if anybody has heard that Wednesday night's out of order, please let me know so we can dismiss. And if not, you be here. That's what I'll tell them. Oh, we know the reasons why we can't, but sickness, circumstances beyond our control, and death. Now, keep the essentials and the revelation of the prayer chain. We've not said much about it, but the fellows are going to be asking and checking. That in, this, that in these 40 days plus the feast days of Sunday, that the prayer chain not be broken. Not any time. 24 hours a day. A wheel in a wheel. Going all the time. Keep the essentials and the revelation of the prayer chain. Number two, attend seven Friday night prayer meetings. I hate to say if at all possible, lest the door of excuse open. But the Lord's not led me this way in, until this year, until nine years. Now he has. And I give you this encouragement by the witness of the Holy Spirit. God wants us to pray. We'll come and share a meditation and then we will pray. We'll pray through midnight and we'll go home. I'm very much aware there are some persons who are ill in body. I am very much aware there are persons who can be excused. I would ask those persons to pray with us. Pray with us. Pray with us from 10 to 12 on Friday night. That way we'll all be together. But I trust that everyone who's supposed to be here will be here because this is the way the Lord has led and has spoken through me. Thirdly, for Lenten reading, may I recommend a voice in the wilderness? May I recommend a voice in the wilderness? It is the finest writing I know of outside of Scripture yes, sir. on what true fasting is all about. It is the life, the walk of one man who has really lived a life of fasting, true fasting, a life of self-denial in order that the glory of God would be all his. These are my recommendations. I do not feel that they're excessive. If God leads you to abstain from food, then do it. If God leads you to fast a meal a day, or two meals a day, or all day, or three days, or with water beyond water and food. Some of us, for our own health, are already in a fast. It can also be a spiritual fast, even though it's for health. It can work both ways. I pre- appreciate all that have joined me in for health reasons. Because the night I said that, God spoke. And a month's gone by, I'm seven or eight pounds lighter. It's one reason I got the brown suit back on tonight. Now, Jesus said for us all to start. 
I believe that's right. God said, hey, how much lighter are you tonight? Several pounds. So much so that he's pulled up the last bit of his belt, made a new hole, and I've offered to buy him a new belt. But see, he heard me. About the same amount. See, God, now Rodney, that's not for you. Uh, Rodney is the envy of everybody. He, he can eat everything and anything and lose weight all at the same time. His metabolism is something else. So you see, in one sense, Holy Spirit has spoken to us even a month ago about those of us for health, who, for health reasons, need to lose weight. There's also another reason, and that is because of, of the possibility of not having as much food as we might like in the next year or two. God speaks to us about that. Uh, I am trusting that no one will have considered me fanatical. It's an awful shock to my system that some considers that I've been fanatical about this. Just a terrible shock to my system. But I am trying to be balanced. And if you feel like I'm unbalanced on this, pray for me. Because I do wish to be balanced. I have tried to correct imbalance. I think already Jesus has shown us that 81 is the time to prepare. We've had two good months at decent prices to prepare. And we're trusting for more. I'm thankful for the winter rains that help the winter wheat to come in. I'm thankful. I said, Jesus, you're holding your hand back. You're having mercy on us. I appreciate it, Jesus. I'm trying to go by what you said through your servant. See, I've tried to be balanced. So when I got the word that I was imbalanced, that I was off, I, it sort of shocked me because I was working hard to be balanced about it. Just, oh, I was working with all my might. And, uh, but I think anybody that thinks that they could pray for me, that I might uh, be balanced. Keep the essentials. If you're not on the prayer chain, Stephen, or you, you're the one who keeps that list, Pastor Steve would be glad to hear from you. We're trying to pray 24 hours a day. There are some thin spots. You know how I felt about those who take the early prayer and all crowd up at the 6 to 8 o'clock hour. I have felt that was improper. That we should be around the clock. And that there are persons who can wake up at 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock and go back to sleep who have that gift that should be taking those spots. There are other persons who wake up and once they do it, it's uh, they're gone. They can't wake, they can't do it anymore. So they shouldn't be on that. But there are persons who have a gift. It could be even that during this time <clears throat> that you could sacrifice a little loss of sleep so that for sure for six weeks that that prayer chain is unbroken. Attend the prayer meetings and read A Voice in the Wilderness because it's the finest reading outside of the New Testament that I know anything about it that speaks of what I'm speaking about tonight, what fasting, the life of self-denial, is all about. These are my recommendations. Pray further about the guidance of God as to what He might have you do in a personal way as to the symbols. But I wanted to get down to the essence tonight and speak to you about it. The Lord has shown me a wonderful thing, and I've been privileged to share it with you tonight. When the boys open their mouth back here in amazement, it means that God's helped me. He's helped me. Showed me something about Jesus' ministry and about Brother Ham that just shocked these fellows. The why that the symbol is not emphasized. And uh, I'm so glad that I got to share that with you here tonight. Dear ones, a number of people are under conviction. A number of us are under conviction. And I pled with you folks Sunday. I pled with the regulars every time we've ever reached this in 12 years. The regulars drop out. And I'm looking the audience over. I'm seeing a good Wednesday night crowd. But I'm looking the audience over and seeing that sure enough, they dropped out. Now I'm going to talk to them again Sunday. You have to pray for me. I'm going to have to, you're going to have to pray for me because they didn't hear me. They didn't hear me. I see, I see vacancies that should not be here. See, you don't have to, you can feel encouraged, but you want to pray. 
Well, pray for me because what's happened is that we're ready to bring forth children. And when they didn't show up tonight, I knew they didn't hear me. They weren't willing. They weren't willing to walk this life I'm talking about. All, all they're interested in is enough of a symbol to, to appease the conscience. It's not good enough. And you can run up and down these roads and find churches that will be glad to have you. I've said that twice. But God wants us completely His. All for Him. And so I've been pleading for it at the risk of losing people. I lost a family three Sundays ago. I may have lost another family Sunday. I knew that when I spoke as I did, I might. But I'm going to have to keep talking. I'm going to have to keep preaching until we get it. I can't, I can't let go now after all these years. Just simply because God's helped us to have almost 400 in preaching, that isn't it. My, what he, what he wants here in a hurry is way over 400. Because the lambs are out there and they're ready to be born. And they're, they need to be fed. And on Wednesday night when we come here, they need a word from God. And you, we got such a backslidden habit of missing when the church doors uh, are open that uh, we were, we're not here to feed them. See, and they notice that. First thing new converts note is when you don't show up on Wednesday night. First thing they note. They know it. They're fresh. They're glad. They think everybody ought to be bursting the doors down to get there. Would be if everybody was doing more than symbolic. I can't hardly wait to get here. I'm in great need, but I can't hardly wait to get here. It's part of the reason I can't hardly wait to get here. Because I know the hymns of Zion and the word of God. And I may hear from God somewhere. I may see God do a miracle. Like in the choir number. That's where he touched your heart, Barbara. When I prayed in there a few moments ago. So I'm, I'm pleading with you. I'm trying to be gentle. I'm trying to be balanced. I'm trying to have God's help. I'm trying to do the very best I know. But I want to compliment you for being in this place tonight. Now, Brother Max, how many are there here? You see, that's what we had last Wednesday night. So some regulars didn't hear me. So you pray for me Sunday. So often one excuses himself, 30, 40, or 50 others do it. But if we're going to bring forth these children, we're going to bring forth, bring these sinners into this place, then we're going to have to be faithful. And uh, I know of families tonight who have sick persons who can who can be here. I, I'm not referring when those things come, but I'm talking about folks. If you regularly miss, God's called you to be here when God's about ready to give us souls, and you and you chicken out, you pan out for whatever reason. It's not good enough. I'm asking you to pray and to walk a life of true fasting. And give your all to God for as many as can be with us. As, as must be with us, then let's show up here on Friday night, the next seven Friday nights, by God's grace. I want to thank you at the close of this service that I feel lighter than I did at first. That's a wonderful sign. That's encouraging for you to respond like this.